Keely, I've lost, and and you've seen how much I'm cooking and so on. So, yeah. good afternoon if you are in North America. Good evening if you are in Europe or Israel or the Middle East. Good middle of the night if you're in Asia. Good morning in Australia, and hello in Hawaii. Um, I'm Fred Plotkin, and this is your weekly segment of. Fred Plotkin on Fridays on idajo.com slash live, where I have guests, some of whom are close friends, such as today's, some of whom I've never met. And the theme is always music, but also inspiration. And yes, we have a pandemic going on. Yes, there are a lot of politics in the world. That is not going to be the theme. Uh, if we mention the pandemic, it's just because it's something that is about today. But really, it's about Francesco Cilufo, who you see in front of you. He is from Milano. Actually, it's in Milano. He is from Torino, and we're going to talk about that. Francesco is a fabulous conductor who is also a fabulous composer who has written operas, symphonic works, vocal works, and he is from that tradition of the composer conductor that Bernstein, Mahler, Mendelssohn, interestingly, all Jewish guys did a lot. Mozart, too, he was not Jewish, but um, Jews would have to be happy to have him if he were Jewish. And um, the idea is that Francesco, I believe, follows his own stars, his own model. Uh, he follows his own inspiration, really. And I have been following his career for about 13 years. We figured out we met in February of 2010 in New York for reasons that I will discuss. Um, listeners will find he speaks fabulous English because a great part of his life is spent in Great Britain and Ireland. So welcome, Francesco. Thank you so much. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, just home now. Now, you mentioned that you roasted a chicken that yes. just came out of the oven. By the time we're done, it's going to be cold chicken, but that's okay. <laughs> it's good cold, too. It's so um, hot here. Pardon me? It's so hot here. that It's I don't hot mind here in New York as well. Yeah. Um, I, I want to start with the city of Torino, Turin where you are from. It is a city I know incredibly well. I have spent a great deal of time there. Uh, if you know my book, Italy for the Gourmet Traveler, I talk about 504 cities around Italy. And I say that the two major cities that are most undervalued by visitors are Bologna and Torino. I went to school in Bologna. I'm a graduate of the University of Bologna. Torino by train is five hours from Bologna. Torino to me, and you correct me if you think I'm wrong, is in some ways the least Italian city. It has more in common with Paris and Vienna in that it was an imperial capital. And the Savoy family, the monarchs of the kingdom of Savoy, who later became part of the unification of Italy when it was a um, mon constitutional monarchy were in Torino. Um, Giuseppe Verdi and Puccini spent a great deal of time in Torino. Puccini premiered Manon Lascaux and La Boheme in Torino, the Teatro Reggio. So um, if Torino did nothing else, it had that. Um, because the Savoy monarchs were fascinated by ancient Egypt, they hired French scholars, because remember, it was not Italy then. They hired French scholars to go to Egypt and basically bring all kinds of things to Torino. So one of the greatest Egyptian museums in the world is actually in Torino. There's the one in Cairo, of course. There's a great collection in Berlin and London and New York. But I would put my money on the one in Torino. So that when Verdi, who was a senator in the new Italian Republic, which was based in Torino at the time, was in town for 
political reasons, he spent a great deal of time studying the Egyptian collection of the Savoya family, and that inspired AIDA, which you have conducted. So when you conducted AIDA, did you go to the Egyptian Museum? Or tell me about your Torino boyhood. Well, actually, Egyptian Museum is very much part of it because um, now it has all been renovated in rather a wonderful way, I have to say, and really, really, really great place to visit. But um, when I was little, I forced my father to take me to two places, the opera and the Egyptian Museum. Uh, now, uh, in the opera, I could actually get the job because I discovered that they were hiring children for the children choir. So I got the job there. I couldn't get a job in the Egyptian museum because I was a bit beyond my in, you know, Egyptology studies for <laughs> someone who was, you know, between seven and 12 years old. But I used to go there constantly because I had a great fascination for that world. And at the same time, I was discovering operas. You know, my first ever opera I've ever heard in my life was indeed Aida, because my father used to play um, the recording of it in the house. And I was, I think, between four and five. And I remember just asking him, what's all this about and because my father used to be a latin and greek scholar he knew how to you know to tell stories and how to uh, grasp an audience attention and he said to me well you know do you want me to play it all and just explain to you what happens so i said yes of course and three hours after i was you know done for it i decided in that moment that i would become a conductor and an opera composer at the same time um, and so when I used to go to the Egyptian Museum, for me, it was like being in a set of, of Aida. Um, and that's very much part of, of, of Turin life. It still is. But I think, especially at that time, when, you know, either you had books about Egypt at home or you, there was no such a thing as the Internet or something else. So you would go to the, to the Egyptian Museum. Um, but yes, I think... Turin, I'm sure you know, I mean, you know, I, I used to say that Fred Plot, Plotkin knows most things about Italy much more than Italian native. And that's true because he always helped me. I mean, I remember as well, <laughs> I was always like, oh, have you been to that place? Maybe it's just around the corner, but because you were born there, uh, you, you didn't know about that. And then, you know, you, you know, you teach many, many things, but, you know, discovering beautiful things about Italy is one of the things that you do. Um, but Torino has a very, very special quality to it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think also I, and part of the Piedmontese characters, I'm sure you know, is, is understatement, which maybe explains why um, I score so well in London and England, because in a way the two cultures are very similar. Um, so, for example, you know, one of the biggest uh, square, Piazza in Torino, is Piazza Castello. Mm -hmm. And all the facade of the building are the same. And yet, behind each of those facades, there's even maybe there's a Baroque church or there's the Teatro Reggio, which was, you know, which was rebuilt in the 70s. So it would actually look completely different from that facade from, from the 17th century. Uh, and but it's part of the Turin character. So, for example, Maria Callas, that you will never imagine connected to Torino, did her, her very first recording there at the Rai Studios. The first yeah. recital was there, and also the last debut in a way she made was in Torino as director, because the only opera Maria Callas ever directed was the Vespri Siciliani mm -hmm. in the 70s. She did it in Torino, or you know. Um, you know, Friedrich Nietzsche, the, the German philosopher, you know, going mad there. Uh, uh, or, and, or the, of course, then, as you said, the amazing premiere, world premieres of Bohème and Manon Lescaut. And also it was the first town that gave Arturo Toscanini a shot as music director, because he was music director there. Now, our viewers can see that Francesco is very slim, in good shape, very elegant, of course. Uh, if you've seen me through the years, you know I've lost a lot of weight, but I can put on a lot of weight in Torino because let's not pretend 
it is really one of the great food destinations and wine destinations of the world. You were talking about Piazza Castello and my mind moved one piazza over to Piazza San Carlo where there are bakeries. I mean, yes, there are wonderful bakeries on Piazza Castello and chocolate shops, Barate Milano and Mulasano is a fantastic cafe. Um, it's the home of Lavazza, which is the largest coffee company in Italy and a great supporter of the arts, by the way, is Lavazza and photography and things like that. So um, I'm happy to drink Lavazza. This is not a commercial, but they do support the arts. And um, Torino has the amazing benefit of incredible hazelnuts so that the gelato di nocciola at uh, El Caval Bronze is one of the great dishes of ice cream in the world. Um, the bakeries everywhere. It's just an astonishing place because, and I again compare it to Paris and Vienna, the fact that every producer of food, of drink, of clothing, of things to wear when you go horseback riding or hunting was done for a royal of family. London too in a different way by royal appointment means that there's quality in everything. And whatever we feel about monarchies, they want good things. And so Torino in its very discreet Piedmontese way is full of stunning culture. It has book publishers, uh, another famous family was the Agnelli family of Fiat. And in America, we say Fiat stands for fix it again, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> but, <I'm> Fiat, <laughs> but Fiat um, really revolutionized the post-war era in Italy in good ways and in not good ways. It created labor, but it favored the automobile and not more sustainable means of transport. <clears throat> But um, when the royal family, the Savoyas, were gone from Italy, they, in a way, in Torino and Piemonte, were replaced by the Agnellis, not officially. But I remember I asked a woman on the street on Via La Grange what she thought of Johnny Agnelli, this very elegant man, ladies' man, art collector, so on. Um, and she said, in the Piedmontese are that I can't do, El Nostro Re, he's our king. And um, she was only half joking because he had that kind of presence in Torino as did the whole family. And they created this factory, I believe it's south, but I'm a little wrong on my geography, on no, the no, other no. side of the railway station, it's south, called yeah. Lingotto. Yes. And Lingotto had beautiful Italian architecture. It was a stunning factory that changed the face of industrialization in Italy and gave labor and all kinds of things. But when Lingotto ran its course, so to speak, it became, and by the way, on the roof is this wonderful racing course of Lingotto. Um, it became a concert hall in part for the RAI, for the National Orchestra of Italy. And again, uh, Italy used to have orchestras in different cities. With the condensation for money for other reasons, the RAI Orchestra became the RAI Orchestra of Torino. Other cities such as Milan had their own orchestras and Rome has Santa Cecilia. But the RAI, interestingly, was not placed in the capital. I had Enrico Stinkelli here two weeks ago and he's based in Rome and he broadcast from Rome, but the orchestra is in Torino. They built this really wonderful theater and there are art galleries and um, Italy, which was born in Torino is nearby, whatever we think of that. The slow food movement of which I'm a great sustainer and member. I was born in the town of Bra. And so, this attention, the seriousness of you Piemontesi is put to good use in almost every way and great things are created. And one final thing about Torino and then I'm gonna ask you about your connection to it. The Winter Olympics were held there in 2006. And I believe that you composed a piece that was played there. And I wanna ask you about that. I also worked there, I was hired by NBC News 
to walk around Torino and talk about Torino because if there was fog on the mountains and they couldn't have a ski run, they would come back to me and say, okay, Fred, where are you now? I'm at this tie shop. I'm at the saddle store. I'm at the Tatra Red Show. I'm eating another chocolate <laughs> or ice cream, whatever. Um, and I spent 10 days basically providing color, so to speak, about Torito. I didn't know you then, so I would have looked for you. That was Luciano Pavarotti's last public appearance. He sang Nessun Dorma. And what did you do at the Olympics, Winter Olympics of 20, 2006? Yes, I, I had moved to London two years before that in 2004 because I finished my degree in composition and conducting at the conservatoire in Torino. And uh, I went on to do a master at Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London. And then I stayed in London for a few years for a PhD. Um, but at that time, there was this idea of commissioning composer from Torino, a piece somehow connected, not, not really with the Olympics, but with something connected to Torino or to Piedmont. And I remember, and it had mostly to do with something about literature. And I remember that I did a, a, a string orchestra piece based on a book by Alessandro Baricco, who was one of the you know, most famous Italian writers from Torino. And his very first book was called Castelli di Rabbia, uh, Castle, Castles of Rage, interesting title, mm -hmm. um, and I, which is actually all about the first ever um, um, train trips in Europe, you know, so the, the early ages of, of train traveling. Um, and I chose to use a book by a Torinese uh, inspired by Euro Europe in a way, because I thought that was very central to what Torino and culture in Torino at that moment meant. Mm -hmm. um, as you said, Torino is, is, is not really a, a typical Italian city, as you say, and we say, you know, you just have a walk around, it seems sometimes it's a bit like Lyon, sometimes it's a bit like Paris. Um, and I think so people raised in Torino, especially at that time, uh, were uh, used just to many different things. Um, for example, I mean, uh, if, to this day, even if now low fare uh, flights are available everywhere, as a Torinese, I insist upon going uh, to Paris by train, because that's all we, with the, the train to Paris. It's as Torinese as anything else. Um, and of course, when I was little in school, we learned French, not English. Uh, then I learned English later on in, in middle school, but in elementary school, you were taught French. And as you know, uh, dialect from, from Piedmont has many, many, many French words in it. So for us, it was basically half already in our tongues in a way. One of my very best friends in Italy in the world is from Torino. And while he has not lived there for a while, he works in opera and in the arts elsewhere in Italy and, and other places, but he's always kept his home in Torino and he has a home nearby in, I believe, Ivrea or near Ivrea. Yeah, I love that area. And he he's everything you describe in terms of the train, in terms of a certain kind of refined, discreet culture. He identifies a lot with the British. He wears British shoes. I wear Italian shoes. To him, there's this connection and style and culture that one finds in Florence to some degree with the British, but much more in Torino with the gentlemen's clubs and things like that. And uh, there are restaurants, Il Cambio, which has changed re recently, but Il Cambio was a restaurant where Garibaldi dined and Cavour dined, and it's near the Egyptian Museum. The former Italian Senate is there. It is remarkable the way the Torino is like Vienna and Paris, and that it has a constellation of its opera house, its government buildings, its finest restaurants, its haberdashery, its women's clothing stores, all in a nucleus so that you come, you go shopping. Uh, if you were Puccini, you would go to a bar called Bicerin, 
where they created a drink that he loved that was a combination of cream and chocolate and coffee. And now it's reproduced elsewhere, but you really just want it at the Cafe Bichirin. And that was founded, by the way, in the 1760s by women. It was one of the first women created and run eating places and drinking places of quality anywhere in the world, where you would go and Puccini being Donaiolo, a ladies man, as we say, uh, love going there because of its woman influenced feeling energy. And so when he worked on Manon Lascaux and La Boheme, a lot of it was done at Bichirin. Wow. And it, it's worth going there also for that, but I go for the Bichirin. I did before I went on a diet. But um, one more Piedmontese food, Janduya. Of course. Janduya are, um, we need to explain, chocolate came to Europe via Christopher Columbus. It came to Spain. It got much better use in Switzerland and France and Savoy. And the chocolate houses of Torino are marvelous. The chocolate bar was invented in 1846 in Torino. Vermouth was invented in Torino. Cocktail culture was invented in Torino. And um, because of all those hazelnuts around, the Piedmontese combined ground hazelnut with delicious chocolate and wrapped it in gold wrappers. So, I, among my many passions, when I attend a ring cycle or teach Wagner's ring, and I've been to 48 complete cycles, I prepare my ring dinner that has things like swordfish and things that you would find suggested in the ring cycle. And the Rhine gold are always Janduya in their gold wrap. <laughs> and <laughs> Well, that's, that's, that's interesting. I think I may take you on on that. You actually. should, you should. But um, I want to get back to something specific about you, about Torino, about England in a way. In preparing for this conversation today with my friend, I found that you, your music, your composition is much more inspired by literature than I had ever thought about whether it's Shakespeare plays, whether it's um, works by Primo Levi, the great Jewish writer from Torino. By the way, Turin has a historic Jewish culture tradition. Um, if you know something called the mole, I know you know it. It's an unusual structure that with a it's sort of black and it looks very Victorian and it has a high dome and then a, sort of a needle coming up out of it. That was originally built, I believe, in the 19th century to be a synagogue. Now it's the National Museum of Cinema in Italy. But um, Jewish culture, Jewish thought have always been a part of Torino as a free capital when it was. And so you have based a work on Primo Levi, another one on Italo Calvino. Tell me about the literature music link for you. I think because, as I said before, my approach to music was through opera and theater and vocal music. So I, I could never really separate the musical idea from being inspired by some kind of work of literature, even, even if it was just maybe a, an instrumental work, an orchestral work, there was always a reason behind that, an inspiration to me, I would say, would always would always come uh, through reading. I, 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 you know, with the life of a, as a conductor, reading is a very good, you know, company, because we travel all the time. We spend a lot of time on our own um, between rehearsal. So reading and TV series are the two friends that really very dear <laughs> to conductors. Um, and most of the time it was just inspiration. I would just read, I remember when I was in Guildhall uh, in London, one of the very best teacher I had was Sarah Walker, the mezzo soprano, you know. She was teaching a wonderful course about writing for the voice. And, um, and so we, we as composer, we had to choose text. And I remember that she was quite amazed because I would take like a, a, a book of poetry, like, you know, thick, and I would just go like, no, no. Yes, no, I, I would just kind of know immediately what had music potential for me. Um, 
And I think in a way... Was the meaning of the words, the sound of the words, a bit of both? I think, I think it was. I, I think I had this, this uh, sixth sense, probably, in seeing when there's something that could be enhanced by music. There are, there are some wonderful poems that we'll never want to touch. Um, and I think it's the same, the same thing apply on a bigger scale from song to opera. And I think one thing that I particularly think it's important to know is that when you do an opera about a, a book, uh, in a way, I guess also like when you do a movie about a book, you are not trying to reproduce that book in another medium. You're trying to take inspiration from that book, from what that book may be really says, although it may not be so apparent, and actually do something about it. So for example, uh, I remember when The Tempest by Thomas Des came out in London when I was a student, and I, was, I used to uh, see quite regular uh, Thomas Des at that time. He, most critics were because he wasn't faithful enough to the Shakespeare test, of course, Shakespeare being you know, the ultimate in, in, you know, great uh, author. But I think in a way, if you think what Verdi did you know, with Falstaff, one of the most amazing opera ever, uh, which I conducted last year at the Grange Festival in London, you know, he condensed it inside, I mean, a Boyd, of course, did for him, but you know, we know that Verdi was working very closely. He condensed, it, you know, different works of Shakespeare, and then he put some Boccaccio in it as well. And mm -hmm. the result is so Shakespearean that it's almost like better, quotation, than Shakespeare itself. So I think in a way, literature has always been an inspiration, you know, that it goes touching something in me that gets inspired and wants to say more about it. Um, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to ask you a question specifically about Falstaff, and I'll tell you where I'm coming from, because I realize you're the perfect person to ask this question. I had the great privilege for many years, for about 20 years, to work a lot with Franco Zeffirelli. And Franco was from Florence, but as we know, if you saw his movie Tea with Mussolini, he grew up in an environment in the fascist era surrounded by a group of British ladies. And in the film, they were Joan Plowright, especially his favorite, Maggie Smith, Judy Dench, you get the picture. And he learned his English from them. He learned his Britishness from them. His sense of humor had a lot of British in it, more than sort of the arch Florentine. It had a slightly more rounded, subtle, rude British humor. And um, he loved Shakespeare. He loved England. As we know, he directed Maria Collis and Joan Sutherland in England. He worked a lot at the Met. I actually worked with him first in Verona when I was a student in Italy. And then when I moved back to New York and he was coming to the Met, we continued. And we spoke a lot about Falstaff because that was the first opera he directed at the Met in 1964 with Geraint Evans, the Welsh uh, baritone and uh, Gabriele Tucci recently died. And he made it a very British Falstaff. And in his view, it was a British work that Verdi understood and gave a lot of character and, and fun. And as you said, Boccaccio to it. A conductor maybe such as Riccardo Muti working with a singer such as Ambrogio Maestri, the wonderful Falstaff from Pavia, who Muti trained, see it as a very Italian work on an Italian composer that drew inspiration from Shakespeare and British stories, but then so did Verdi's Macbeth, Rossini's and Verdi's Otello, and there are many, op Romeo and Julietta in many forms, that Shakespeare was inspired by the differences that many Shakespeare plays were set in Italy or Egypt or have Italians in them. Whereas Falstaff is based on the Merry Wives of Windsor and Henry IV part one and is very British. When you conduct Falstaff, given that you bring your Italianness, given that you 
speak beautiful English, you have a great feel for British culture, for Shakespeare, for British literature. Where do you land? Do you, do you have a foot in each camp or what is your approach in developing a production of Falstaff? Well, I think I, I'm very glad you, you asked me this question because actually last year was very special, a very Falstaff year for me because I, I did something that doesn't happen often. You do the same opera in two different production, one after the other. First, I did my first Falstaff in, in Italy, in the Marche region, so central Italy. And that was a 100% Italian production by a young and very talented Italian director called Roberto Catalano, with a whole Italian cast except from Falstaff himself, who was uh, actually Russian. Um, and then, after that, I went to England and I did a completely British Falstaff at the Grange Festival with a wonderful Shakespeare director coming from the Royal Shakespeare Company itself, Christopher Lascombe, and a completely British uh, and English speaking uh, um, cast. And I thought a lot about it. I, look, I, probably my answer is that I think one of the great things of Falstaff is that it doesn't belong really to any part of a specific region or indeed culture. And I think what is really incredible about this opera, apart from the obvious, of course, is that he's his own reflection about death and- Verdi's reflection. Yes, Verdi's reflection about death and the meaning of life. And you think, well, you know, we had the Verdi's Requiem, you know, with, with this incredible, terrible, dramatic characterization of what that, but I think that's, uh, that, that's a confrontation with death, very personal, very strong. But I think in a way Verdi did, like Wagner did with Meistersinger, he'd, he's, he was very autobiographical in that. It was, it, we see basically a man who realized that his time has passed, and, but it's still very much alive and it's still very much revered and part of a structure. And yet he sees their future arriving, uh, what the future brings. You know? And I think there are parts of Falstaff that are on the surface are very comical, are almost like farce-like, but then there's actually a deeper layer which I think in a way in, in, the, in both production in Italy and in England, I, we managed to keep up, which is confrontation with all these issues, which of course are very modern and they're completely uh, uh, without any link to a specific you know, region or nationality or age indeed. Um, I think that, and I think in a way that links for me Falstaff in a way, in a wonderful thread that goes from Mozart, from Così fan tutte and Nozze di Figaro, the end of Nozze di Figaro, through Falstaff. And the next step is Rosencavalier. Because I think at the core of these operas is, is one of, you know, three great opera composers, three great men, three men who somehow represented at best their age, the age in which they were born dealing with the idea of time passing by, of what was the role of human being in the bigger you know, timeline zone. So I'm gonna push back a little bit on one thing you said, and then I'm gonna continue about Falstaff because I agree with you. Um, I know it's often said that Meister Singer is autobiographical about Wagner. I don't quite accept that. I think that it's about his beliefs. But um, I think that apart from the magnificent music, it's not good storytelling. And what he took six hours to do, Verdi did much better in three. And I don't think that Wagner ever repaired a shoe in his life. <laughs> much of the second act is shoe repair and singing lessons. And it really needed a good editor. And Verdi was a better editor and Boito was a responsible librettist. Wagner was his own librettist. But that said, um, I did a lot of research. I mean, Verdi is my hero. I have other composers who are as favorite 
as he is and as musicians and maybe even more, but as a man, Verdi is my hero among all the composers. And so I've read all the letters and I've had the privilege of going to Busseto and other places where his archives are and been able to work in the archives. And I came across correspondence between Verdi and Richard Strauss. And Strauss wrote very affectionate laudatory letters to Verdi about Falstaff. And he asked a lot about the character of Falstaff and about can you be elegant and rustic and crude but lovable and so on. And to me, Strauss in some way, even if he didn't know it, was asking the questions that would lead to the creation of Baron Ox and De Rosencavalier. And if you know Falstaff as a character and as an opera, and then you look at Baron Ox, to me, that's where it comes from, because it's customary to say that De Rosencavalier was influenced by Le Nozze di Figaro, in that the marshal is the countess, and Octavian is Cherubino, and those relationships there, and perhaps Sophie has something of Susanna, though not too much. But suddenly you have a fusion of Mozart and Verdi in De Rosencavalier, which I don't know what you tell me what you think about that, and then we'll talk about Rosencavalier a little more. Yeah, I think it, that's completely spot on. Um, first of all, Strauss said the veneration for Verdi so much that when he wrote his first opera, Guntram, he sent the vocal score to Verdi, who replied very sweetly, saying, like, I think it, it's all great. Unfortunately, I don't speak German, so I can't really give you a feedback <laughs> about the text setting, but I think it's very promising. Um, and then we know that when uh, Strauss uh, made his list in a long letter to Karl Böhm, uh, about which operas are to be considered like masterpiece to be done in a theater, Falstaff was there. Uh, I think we were either in Boccanegra, I think. So he had very good taste for me. Um, yeah. But yes, the idea, and I think Ox is a very interesting character because exactly as you say, clearly comes from Falstaff. In a way, we have some letters between uh, Strauss and Hoffman, Stalin's librettist, in which he was really thinking about Falstaff. Um, but at the same time, I think sometimes maybe we are led astray by the fact that sometimes Ox, as Falstaff indeed, is pictured as a bit of as a, as a buffoon rather than a multi-layered multi character. And what the two characters have in common is that they're both belonging to a, a social class and to a world which is not really up to date anymore. And I think from that comes our reaction and our laughs sometimes about it. But I think, for example, I think about the wonderful Rosenkavari that they did at the Met by, you know, with the direction of Carson, where, you know, you, you, uh, in, in that production, you know, you can see why people would fall for, for Ox. It's not completely, it's not a, it's not a, it's not ridiculous. You know, he has a charm. He was sexy. Uh, in that opera, it was very sexy. It was I mean, a sexy man, but a sexy performance. Yes, where yeah. you—it's kind of like Scarpi and Tosca that if you have a certain baritone, evil though the character is, if he has a certain allure, you can think that Tosca is physically drawn to him, yeah. even though he's revolting. It is there is a, a quality of seduction there that has to be present, which in a way even Falstaff has, despite the fact that everyone at the end, of course, make fun of him. There is some kind of old fashioned chivalry about him that gets women surely quickly. Most time we think that she's almost there to kind of fall for him. So I think, yes, and I think that that's what's great and, and what most composer and conductor, which, you know, Strauss was, uh, do is try to elaborate something that you think is great and try to make it your own. Um, and I think that's what Strauss did with Rosencavalier. He tried to do that other times. He may have succeeded less than, than in Rosencavalier. But that, for me, really is, is the proof that even if he had just written that, Strauss is at the same level of of those other great composers. Robert Carson is my favorite current opera director. Yeah. 
and I'm going to try to get him on here sometime on a Friday. He directed both Falstaff and Rosenkavalier at the Met and updated them not in a random stupid way. He updated Falstaff to the second Elizabethan era, namely the, the 1950s, where everything socially was coming apart in Britain after the war or changing and the old guard was going and lost their way and, and there was a new rising class. And similarly, he set De Rosenkavalier in Vienna in 1913 when the opera was written at the beginning of what would be World War I and all the changes of that. And they're both on DVD, on video. And I commend the people, I never thought to watch them as a pair, but to watch Carson's Falstaff and then his Rosenkavalier from the Met. And it's very interesting. Now, Rosenkavalier. I acknowledge it's a masterpiece. And you said that if Strauss had written nothing else, he still would rank among the great composers. My father, who was a musician who I adored, loved De Rosenkavalier. If I'm asked to name the 100 biggest operatic masterpieces, I would include it, but at number 100. <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> where Meister Singer is 101. Because, um, I mean, God, I, I love operas by Strauss and Wagner. That's no secret. And many of their operas would be in my top 10. But not those, not that one. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, I acknowledge that the orchestration, you as a conductor, must be heaven. Um, the music is gorgeous. The story has great elements that I think only Robert Carson managed to make coherent and plausible. And that's why I loved his production of Rosenkavalier. But um, there's a reason that when I was a kid and maybe when you were a kid, that a lot of the recordings we had of De Rosenkavalier were highlight recordings that basically just included the women <laughs> yes, yes. and whole parts of the opera and Anina and Balzacchi and all them and the Italian tenor and all these extraneous characters, the animal sellers. It's just so much. And I want to focus on the characters. De Rose Cavalier, of course, means the young cavalier who brings a rose to Sophie to propose marriage on behalf of Baron Ox. And this young man was the lover of the marshal and a slightly older woman, age 32, who sees in him her last chance at happiness. That I never bought either. And in the Carson production, I don't want to spoil it, but it's not the end for the marshal, and which is great. And, um, to me, I would have called the opera The Silver Rose, and it would have been that the Marshallin was the title character and not Octavian. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to second guess Hugo von Hoffmannsthal, a brilliant librettist. But um, do you see where other people might find it a beautiful, flawed opera? Yeah, no, I, I totally get it. Also, I think uh, it's very long, uh, and there, there are moments in which you feel that it could be condensed. You know that when Tullio Serafin conducted the, the Italian premiere, La Scala, he went all the way to Garmisch to meet Strauss to ask his permission for cuts. And Strauss didn't really like the idea, but he did say that he was, Tullio Serafin was such a great conductor that eventually he actually agreed on that. Um, it is different medium and you know, when I, when I hear there are so many operas by Verdi, by Puccini, by Mozart, of course, in which I feel there's not a single flow in it. Um, but I think in a way, the flows of Rosenkavalier are themselves part of an era in which excess and uh, overstatement rather than understatement was very much part of the character. In a way, I see it as, you know, as a reaction to what was going on at that time. And in a way, I think that he almost wants to, uh, Strauss almost wants to overindulge in staying with the memory of this kind of precious past, which we know from the very beginning is lost, is not part of our world anymore, which I think is why the Carson production at the Met is really, is, is really a masterpiece. I mean, the way, the way he conceived the third act 
It's, Let's it's, not spoil it. It's fabulous. No, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not going to say what's it's wrong, but it's fantastic. absolutely incredible. Like, yeah, it's a genius. I agree. Um, now, I think that the opera that came right before that, Rosen Cavalier, was Electra, is in my top five masterpieces. Yes. And I think that is the perfect opera. Hoffman Sal did the libretto based on the Greek story. And it's about a hundred minutes. It has the largest orchestra of any opera that we know of. I saw Carson's production. I saw Chirot's production. I've seen every production. Um, I've directed opera in the past, haven't done it for a while. If ever I came back to direct an opera, that would be the opera I'd want to direct. I have a lot of ideas about it. And it is extraordinary. And to me, the musical storytelling, the text is all there. So when they followed that with Rosen Cavalier, which feels three times as long, it has two intermissions intervals, whereas Electra's a one act. I know that Strauss for much of his career had a lot of duality that he would go from Wienerish nostalgia, Wienerish nostalgia to something very jarring and modernistic. And that's great. The only time he didn't was he followed Salome with Electra, where normally he would have gone back and forth between the two styles. Yeah. But I'm, I know that one of the things that you listed among your recordings that you've provided for Adagio listeners was a recording of Regine Crispin as the Marshallin. Uh, I know that we wanted to find a production conducted by Silvio Barviso. It's a little hard to come by. I think you have the George Schulte, which is not bad. No. <laughs> it was pretty great. But yeah. why Regine Crispin? I think because, uh, especially in that recording, I suggest that I think it's the perfect match of a singer who was, of course, a completely operatic singer, but at the same time, the refinement she does, she has with the text. And uh, there's some, there's some frail quality. I would say French, I, I don't like, you know, labels, but in a way, the fact that she doesn't come from that tradition, you know, like Elizabeth Schwarzkopf or other great machine, but the fact that she, learn their way into German, being an excellent, one of the best, possibly the best French soprano ever, who ever lived. Um, it, it gives to her portrait of Marshallin the perfect balance between being still a young woman, because as you mentioned before, she's supposed to be in her early thirties. Now, sometimes we see it with older uh, character, with older singers. Um, so, it's exactly the depiction, the sound, the way she sometimes um, slurs a bit some some words. She stays a bit longer than usual some words. It means that she really got the, the exactly the idea and the feeling of the character of someone, as you said, as Carson also thought that her, you know that she's caught in a frail moment, but that's not the end for her, of, for, of it for her. And she's, I, I just, it's one of the singers that in a way I discovered in more in, uh, in recent years, you know, and I really, really, she, I, I don't know, for me, she's, she's the best there. You are a young man. I am a less young man. But because I began working in opera when I was 16, I had the opportunity to really work with people that you would not expect I would have known. And one of them was Regine Crispin who was, all right, now we're going to get very technical here. Just in, pu in terms of pure sexual allure, there were three women that I would point out that way. Regine Crispin, Elena Obratsova, and Shirley Barrett. All different kinds of women for all kinds of reasons. And it's not a sexiness or a sexuality or a sensuality that can be put on. It's just there or it's not there. And even when she played nuns, <laughs> she was a very sexy nun. And I mention this because she very famously was associated with Francis Poulenc and his opera Les Dialogues de Carmelites, The Dialogues of the Carmelites, where she played different roles at different points in her career. 
Poulenc, who wrote the libretto and it premiered at La Scala in 1957, not in France, insisted that it be performed in the language of the country it was performed in, which is interesting as he wrote the music. So its premiere was in Italian. It was performed, of course, in France and French. And when it came to the Met, it was performed in English. And Regine Crispin performed in it in English in New York. And her English was better than the Americans, the British, the native English speakers, because, as you point out, she had a particular ear for language, for inflection, for for the way a little cadence can come out on a vowel okay. that linked language and music. And so, yes, I commend certainly as you do, Rosen Cavalier in highlight form <laughs> with Regine Crispin. Now you mentioned that you admired very much the conducting of Silvio Varviso, who I think is someone a lot of people wouldn't know. He was born in 1924, he died in 2006. He was Swiss. What is, did you ever meet him? No, I didn't. Okay. What is it about Varviso that you admire? I think for me, it represents one of those conductors that you keep discovering things about. Um, and of course, it's, the, it's a less obvious choice because, um, because, you know, we all grew up with big conductors recording everything. But then, Sometimes, and something that certainly I'm learning in my career as conductor, sometimes you not always, you know, it's not always that you choose exactly where you go. Sometimes things choose you. Um, as you know, I'm also very, uh, very fond of, of rediscovering operas. That's part of my, in a way, job description as principal conductor at the Wexford Festival, where you, you saw me conducting uh, Mascagni. Um, we'll talk about Wexford in a bit. Yeah, and what it's interesting because for me, Silvio Varviso, when I was growing up, was a Rossini conductor because he recorded some wonderful things by Rossini, Barbiere di Siviglia and Italiani in Algeria with the great Teresa Berganza. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, those recordings were so good that you would think that he was a conductor specialized in that. But then I came across a recording of Meister Singer from Bayreuth. And as you know, Bayreuth is not a house where everybody gets to conduct. Um, and then this selection of Rosenkavari with Regine Crespin with the Wiener Philharmonica came up. So I looked at Bayreuth and I saw that this man has conducted basically everything. And, and then the last thing I saw by him was the, in this DVD, uh, funnily enough, with a production by Robert Carson of Manon Lescaut. And that was great as well. So I thought that I, in a way I sympathize with him because I, he is a conductor that I admire a lot. All his recordings have something that speaks to me. And at the same time, I think as a conductor that has suffered from being labeled. And labels, as you know, in our profession are something that sometimes can be a bit dangerous as well, because you never know. And in a way, I mean, when you have figures like uh, Leonard Bernstein or other huge, big international talents, it's easier to accept that they may do one day Bohem, the other day their own music, and another day, you know, Stravinsky. But, you know, it's something labels shouldn't really be put there unless someone really wants to have them. Um, you know, if you think about me this year, I conducted the Italian premiere of a huge piece by John Adams, so American music, uh, absolute jest. Um, but then, you know, I've just recorded a, a, a CD of Belcanto's arias in Krakow, so mostly Donizetti and Rossini and Bellini. And then there's Wexford, and before the pandemic was happening, I was supposed to do Manon Lescaut in London. So, and the fact that I'm a composer, I think it reaches that. And so sometimes it's, for example, I, unless it's their own choice, I, I, I don't like to see um, colleagues or, you know, when it happened to me at the very early stages of my career, think, well, is a composer, therefore he conducts contemporary music. I mean, I do that as well. I, I conducted world premieres, for example, work by Italian composer Marco Tutino, who I'm sure you know, because 
I do One know. of the world premiere was in San Francisco. And he's listening to us. Ciao, Marco. <laughs> yes, good. I know he's listening. <laughs> no, because, you know, and so that's contemporary music. But again, it's contemporary music written uh, with the knowledge of everything that was there before. So in a way, I think I chose Varviso because in a way I see it as a poster child for not do not labels conductor. Um, Varviso, I looked him up a bit in terms of New York, what I might have heard him in was I was a child. And it is rather stunning what he did in five years at the Met. Beginning in 1961, he conducted the Metropolitan Opera debut of Joan Sutherland as Lucia de Lamamore, was his first job. Then Dorothy Kirsten as Madame Butterfly, Elizabeth Söderström and De Fledermouse. This is all in the same year or so. Then the next year, Adriana Lecouvre, Renata Tibaldi, and Franco Corelli. La Sonambula, Joan Sutherland, Nikolai Guetta. Madama Butterfly, Licia Albanese. Mm. Die Zauberflirte, Anna Moffo, Nikolai Guetta. Then Ariadne of Noxos. Aida with Birgit Nielsen and Franco Corelli. Lucia again with Sutherland, a new production. A mixed bill of the ballet, Le Sufide and Donizetti's Don Pasquale. Then the last performance at the Met, Le Conte d'Offman, The Tales of Hoffman with Giuseppe Di Stefano, his last performance. <laughs> and that was all in the old house, the old Metropolitan Opera House. And the new one, uh, Il Barbieri di Siviglia, Aida with Leontine Price, Don Giovanni with Cesare Siepi, Martina Royo, Faust with Nikolai Guetta, uh, Pilar Lorengar, and Cesare Siepi, and then a new production of Aida with Leontine Price and Richard Tucker. That was all in the space of seven years in the 1960s. So I'm sure I, I went to the Aida with Price. Maybe I saw a couple of the others. I did not see Jones Lucia. I did not see Birgit's, Nielsen's uh, Aida, I would know that. And I knew Lee Chalbanese very well, but I did not ever see her perform on stage. Then he was gone and he worked in Europe and there are mysteries in a musician's career, how certain theaters were very popular, this change of management, and suddenly they don't think to call you. And after Rudolf Bing left, whoever the new managers were did not think to call Silvio Varviso. I got to work at the Met in late 1980, 81, in 1983, he came back to conduct Die Valkyra, which could not be more different from everything he did in the 60s. And part of my job was to go to the maestro and, and explain what I was supposed to do and provide support to the maestro and anything they needed. Often it was my responsibility to see to it. So I came to know these conductors and I would always ask, can I sit in on your rehearsals? I want to learn how you work. I want to learn. They all said yes. Carlos Kleiber said yes. They all said yes. And so did Silvio Varviso. And here was Di Valkyra with Gwyneth Jones as Brunhilde, uh, Franz Ferdinand Nentwig as Wotan, Manfred Jung as Sigmund, and Hildegard Behrens as Siglinda. That was the first, actually the second time I worked with Behrens. I'd worked with her before on Idomeneo. Mm -hmm. and with Pavarotti. And so it was stunning. And if you were to ask me what kind of conductor Varvisa was, I would say it was a Wagner conductor because that's what I heard him conduct. And maybe being Swiss where they have German, French and, and Italian heritage, even though he had an Italian surname, maybe that gave him a certain, not only neutrality, but multinationality that enabled him to conduct in all of these different ways. But he's someone I commend to people who are, want to study conductors. Another one is Klaus Tenstedt, who was a marvelous conductor who died too young and people don't seem to remember him that much. Another conductor who I know you love, I was very fortunate to know him. He was my first professional teacher, so to speak, was Leonard Bernstein, and who was born in 1918 in Massachusetts, but we think of him as a New Yorker. 
And he, we know, conducted the New York Philharmonic at age 25 in 1943, became music director of the Philharmonic, wrote Broadway musicals, great ones such as Wonderful Town, Candide, which may be an opera, uh, West Side Story. He wrote symphonies, all masses, all kinds of things. He was a great political figure. He was an incredible teacher. He was just the best teacher. And he created what were called young people's concerts. There were 53 of them that were broadcast on CBS in the United States, where millions of people got to watch him at Lincoln Center before at Carnegie Hall, conducting the New York Philharmonic and teaching. And he would have very young musicians such as Yo-Yo Ma and the pianist Andre Watts. And he had sort of a group, I call it a focus group of kids, seven, eight, nine years old, who he would test his ideas on in rehearsal, so to speak, before doing the performance. And I was one of those kids. So my training would come in that he would layer in everything I learned because he was great as he was as a teach, as a conductor and as a composer, no better teacher I've ever come across as regards music. And one of the things that you, one of the pieces that you listed for listeners to listen to is his symphony number no. three, the Kaddish symphony from 1963. Why that piece? I think because I think of all Bernstein works, including everything that he wrote. I think that's the most underrated. I think probably because he has a speaker rather than a soloist, which sometimes make things a bit awkward for audience because you feel there's someone reading a text on top of the music, I don't know. Um, it may also be that the fact that his text is very, it's very beautiful, but of course it deals with something that not everybody necessarily wants to face, which is the relationship uh, often frustrating between man and God. Um, and we are talking about, of course, Jewish God, but it's a much broader sense of, you know, man versus divinity or fate. Um, and I just think it has some of the most astonishing music he ever wrote. And at the same time, I think you feel one of the many struggles that was going on, I think, in Bernstein's life, which was on one side wanted to express this amazing music that would just flow out of him. And on the other side, knowing that the establishment at that time thought that him being a broader composer and the tonal composer in a moment in which tonality was considered to be really you know, anathema, um, he felt that he had to prove himself to show that he could write also as the serious people wanted. But because it was a, such a great old man theater, I think he, that's why I think it's his masterpiece, uh, at least in the, his classical production, is that he used all the, you know, the seriality, atonality, all the experimental avant-garde uh, music to portray the conflict. But then when the conflict is somehow resolved, then it opens up the tonality because that's what he felt that was being, um, you know, ma making peace with, with, with something or someone that he comes from. It, it's the same thing that he did in his, in his opera, A Quiet Place, when the relationship, the relationship there was between an actual father, his father, who in the opera is actually called exactly like his own father, Sam, and the young uh, character of the opera, which is clearly autobiographical. Um, I think, in a way, I, I've, I've never, I didn't have the luck to see Bernstein live, unfortunately. But I, in a way, I feel connected to him just because uh, one of the conductor I assisted when I was very young was John Mauceri. And John Mauceri was music director in Torino. Yes. First, it, the first American music director that Torino ever had. Um, and so, and when I was studying uh, conducting, I attended, I assisted John, and he taught me a very special way to mark scores with colors that he learned from Bernstein and, who, and that Bernstein learned from Fritz Reiner when he studied at Curtis in Philadelphia. So in a way is this kind, and I, have, I, I can say I'm old enough to have taught that same method to younger colleagues who, are, who assisted me 
in the last that's wonderful so i think and in a way that's why you said you know birth and being a teacher in a way still teaches us in a way through the generation of people like john marche like michael tilson thomas uh, you know everyone that has been lucky enough to be around him like you or other people and i think that's connection but i really think that kaddish uh, is really a piece that people should really know. And I actually, I selected the first recording he did with his wife, Felicia Montealegre, reading, you know, wonderful actress, um, reading the text, because then he changed a bit the text in order to be less offensive in a way, possibly, and he recorded again with Montserrat Caballé. And as- 1977, he made the revisions. Yeah, yeah. but I think the first, version away is still is still better. So a few things. Um, I found some notes that he wrote at the time, and I'm going to read them in a moment. But I do want to mention two things. One is Bernstein would have been 100 two years ago. And there were all kinds of Bernstein centennial activities, including Harvard and the University of Michigan doing an oral history project. And I was one of many, 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 many people they interviewed. And it will eventually come out and it'll be a wonderful resource for everyone to learn about Bernstein through his very diverse and fascinating life. Um, he himself said it was the most extensive 12 tone writing that he had ever done. Could you tell our listeners what is 12 tone writing? Yes, well, it's a it's a technique that was invented by Austrian composer Arno Schoenberg at the beginning of the 20th century, in which uh, composers decide to experiment rather than using the tonal system, which is the what most of them the classical music and we say is, is bass, which is tonality. You just take the 12 notes that compose a scale. And uh, each one of them is as important as the other one. There's no idea that there's a, 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 there is a, there's a structure in it, but you just use them in different combination. It's a very kind of mathematical thing. And you combine them one after the other, always in a different way, and you never repeat the same note. So basically you hear all 12 of them, and then you start again hearing 12 of them, but in different combination. And the experiment was to try to say things with a different medium, as very much as, uh, you know, abstract art uses the colors in a, in a non-figurative linear way. Uh, they try to do that with music. And as with many avant-garde things, great composer wrote amazing music with that. Schoenberg is one of them. Alban Berg is another one of them. Some other less so. Um, in a way, it was a, a, an historical moment in which people want to break from uh, that. And I think, in a way, nowadays we know that that was just one of the many voices of the 20th century. Unfortunately, Bernstein suffered because when he was born, when he studied, that was still considered to be the thing to be done. So it was considered to be, avant-garde was considered to be the top in a music and everything else was slightly under that. Uh, but that 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 destiny didn't it was wasn't just there for 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 Bernstein. It was Samuel Barber, another great American composer, had the same problem. I mean, Vanessa musically is a masterpiece. But when they did it in at the Met, was it was was a big success. But they did it in Salzburg, and it was a flop. Um, Vanessa, by the way, was written for Maria Callas, but she ultimately decided she didn't want to play it. So it was sung by very well by Eleanor Stieber. If you and readers, listeners will permit me, I'm going to read something that Bernstein wrote that were his, they stimulated his thoughts about writing the Cottage Symphony. It's a little long, but not too long. He said, what is a father in the eyes of a child? The child feels my father is first of all, my authority with power to dispense approval or punishment. He is secondly, my protector. Thirdly, my provider. Beyond that, he is healer, comforter, lawgiver, because he caused me to exist. And that, and as the child grows up, he retains all his life in some deep, he retains for all of his life in some deep, deep part of him, 
the stamp of that father image whenever he thinks of God, of good, of evil, or of retribution. For example, take the idea of defiance. Every son, at one point or other, defies his father, fights him, departs from him, only to return to him if he is lucky, closer and more uh, secure than ever before. Again, we clearly see the parallel with God, Moses protesting to God, arguing, fighting to change God's mind. So the child defies the father and some of the things and some of that defiance also remains throughout his life. So I think a lot can be spoken about the fact is that there is a thing in the Jewish tradition of a man speaking directly to God, as you mentioned, but there are also father issues. Let's not go Freudian here, but we know that Bernstein's father was rather disapproving of his son's desire to move to New York. His father, I think, was a tailor. Uh, nothing wrong with being a tailor. It was a hairdresser. But, hairdresser, okay. Um, nothing wrong with that either. And But Bernstein had this genius and he moved to New York and the great success we all know. And his father grudgingly finally said, well, I guess you could make a living doing what you're doing. (laughs) But the father couldn't comprehend really what Bernstein did. But famously, his first performance with the Philharmonic uh, in 1943 was broadcast on the radio. And the father heard it from Carnegie Hall. The father heard it in Boston. And heard the ovations for the young Bernstein who had stepped in. I believe for Bruno Walter, but don't quote me. And so that text that Bernstein wrote, how do you respond to that in terms of the, what the symphony says and what Kaddish is? I'll just say one more thing, that um, Kaddish is usually said as the prayer for the dead, but nowhere in the text, I read it last night, do they mention death, but they mention life three times. Prego. Um, yes, well, the relationship with the father is, is central to, to, to Kaddish as it is in a way to Judaism, because Judaism, one of the many things that Judaism has not is certainties about God and relationship with God. Uh, famously, there's a famous rabbi in, that I spoke with, dealing with a, a very, very personally, a very personal moving moment for me and for my father, actually, who was very ill. And I remember asking uh, her, um, a, a reform rabbi, asking her, what, so what, what do you think happens when we die? You know? and, and she says, I think, because that was, I think we go back um, to God. And I say, but what do you mean by that? And she says, I don't know. <laughs> and I think uh, the what is really great about this, and, and that that's actually part of what your um, what the text you read is about, is that the acceptance of the dialogue that doesn't necessarily arrive anywhere, which is also very essential to Greek philosophy, as you know, um, is very central to that as well. I think the, the acceptance, and in, we know that Bernstein had several issues about acceptance, about you know, his sexuality, about his relationship with his family, and his relationship with who he was as a composer, a conductor, all the struggle. And I think Kaddish is the ultimate place where we actually see it, and we see him dealing with that. And it, it ends on the very, in a way, in a positive note, not a reassuring note, but a positive one, which that basically says, and that's a general message for us, I think in this, in this difficult time we are all living, is that the work is, is always worth doing it. Um, both for us as a, within ourselves and with the peop- towards the people we care for. There is something that's been superimposed on the symphony that he didn't ask for. He was very close to President John F. Kennedy. And Jacqueline Kennedy was the most ardent supporter of the arts of any first lady we've had. And 
in ways that were extraordinary and we don't have time to talk about it now, but believe me, it was because of her that we have Lincoln Center, the Kennedy Center, we have all kinds of things because of Jacqueline Kennedy. And um, Kennedy was assassinated on November 22nd, 1963. Bernstein had completed the music before, but not much before. And Kaddish being um, a prayer for the dead, he didn't, Bernstein didn't write that for Kennedy, the way the Verdi Requiem commemorates Manzoni and Rossini. But it just happened that Kennedy died. And Bernstein said that we have to make music more passionately, more powerfully than ever before. It premiered in December of 1963 in Tel Aviv. And a lot of people have associated the symphony with the death of Kennedy, but really not. Sometimes factors in life outside of art happen that make the art seem more relevant, but it was this was not the case. No, I think it, it, what really spurred uh, Bernstein in writing the symphony was actually the feeling of a potential nuclear war mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the possible annihilation of, of, of human race, you know, and the Cold War. So of course, when that came up, the assassination of Kennedy, of course, uh, then it seems really to fit in that. But yes, it was a much, it was a less specific concern. It was much more general, I would say almost a philosophical concern. Yeah. So Francesco, there are three things I want to cover and we have 15 minutes. So okay. I, I want to get to you. I met you when you came to New York to conduct the opera you wrote, Il Caso Mortara. And it was done in 2010 at the Capo Opera. And it was the first opera written by an Italian in the Italian language to premiere in New York in a hundred years, the previous one being Puccini's La Fanciulla del West at the Met. And so it was quite a big thing. I'm gonna ask our listeners to go learn about the story of Il Caso Mortata, basically a Jewish baby in Bologna who was kidnapped, baptized, uh, the Pope got involved, the unification of Italy got involved, he became a Catholic priest. But what was the experience of bringing that to New York at that time like? I think it was certainly one of the highlights of my life uh, because I've always dreamed of having an opera perform, performed in New York for some reason. I remember saying when I was in, in college, thinking like, you know, one day uh, when we go to New York for my, the premiere of my opera, and a lot of people said like, oh yeah, of course. you." Um, but so that was a dreaming come true, a double dream coming true because that was made possibly uh, initially by uh, uh, Tobias Speaker, who is a, who is a compo an American composer whom I, I admire and has been very much a mentor to me in my composition year. Um, uh, because his opera in Milan was, in a way, a, a, for me, a strong motivation to continue writing in a, in a difficult moment I lived in my 20s. Um, and so it, all this was coming together because I was working in, uh, at the opera with him and with Michael Capasso who was doing the director direction. And uh, it was amazing because I was seeing coming to life, you know, this story this that had so many resonance in my life in italy in you know jewish history in american history as well um and and so it was incredible and and i actually i also remember that that was the first time i was staying in new york for a long time i got to discover new york as a new yorker and in fact you may remember that my very first time at the met was with you i do not you, remember that yes you took me to see barbiere di Siviglia. Okay. <laughs> and when I was in rehearsal, and uh, that was the, my very first time at the Met, um, and then I got to discover so many, so many, so many other things. Muti was conducting Attila at the Met at the same yes. time, um, and I felt that with that, I reached a point in which I said, "I've done this. I'm very proud of this." Uh, so even if I had to, you know, if I stopped composing from the day after that. Uh, I can call myself happy with that. And in a way, that's also, I think, in a way, a, you know, ending and beginnings, that's when I started to be more a conductor after that, because in a way I felt that I said really something that I, was important for me to say. 
and uh, I have great memories of that. We are always in the hope that Steven Spielberg completes these movies about Mortara, who is a project that he wants to do. Um, and uh, I don't know, but it was very, very special. And would you write the music for Steven Spielberg's movie? I'm sure Mr. John Williams <laughs> has already <laughs> stepped in for that, and I'm very happy for him to let loose. But it would be great if I was. I, I always wonder if Steven Spielberg got word about the opera because, you know, as you remember, New York Times did a big piece about that, and Thomas yes. Hill re reviewed it very well, and and uh, it was sold out for you know. And so I hope, in a way, that a bit of that gets somehow in the making of it. Second question, just briefly, but importantly, you are principal conductor of the Wexford Festival, which is this magnificent festival in Ireland that I just adore. And you have, they love you there. Someone said to me, oh, Francesco is a darling. He's such a darling. <laughs> and you've conducted a lot of lesser known Italian operas, mostly from the Verismo era. Uh, I heard you conduct Guglielmo Ratcliffe and by, I'm suddenly blocking the Mascagni. Yes. And one of the recordings that we've listed for listeners is actually your recording of that. Um, talk about the Wexford Festival, about what makes it special and about your life as an Italian Irishman. <laughs> well, yes, uh, uh, Wexel is a place where I felt completely at home from the beginning, um, because since I was little, when I started to get into opera, I would learn and, and discover the of normal, let's say, operatic work. But at the same time, um, I, had, I already had this curiosity about lesser known works. So actually, I played a, a bit of Ratcliffe when I was 13, never imagined I would end up conducting the actual opera when I was older. Uh, I think one of the great things about Wexer Festival is that it gives chance to operas to have a second life. And, uh, and the way the, work, the festival works in this small, beautiful town, you know, uh, two hours south of Dublin, on the sea, um, you have this beautiful, amazing opera house built just a few years ago with amazing acoustic for the voice and the orchestra, the balance. And uh, you get to spend a month and a half really working inside a piece that deserved to be heard again. And that happened with William Ratcliffe. Then I did uh, Alfano's Resurrezione. Alfano is well known, of course, for having finished Turandot, but there's so much more about it. Yeah. And that's Your a de Bergerac is another work of his I love. Yes. And yeah. you know, and, and the Resurrezione brings the Italian and Russian souls mm -hmm. together, that I know something that is that is dear to you. Um, then I did a double bill of Malavita by Giordano and L'Oracolo by Leone. It was a huge success at the Met when Antonio Scotti did it in the 30s. Um, and this year would have been the beginning of my tenure as music, uh, yeah. as principal conductor uh, with Edmea by Catalani, uh, one of the early opera by Catalani that was championed by Toscanini in Torino. So again, a connection with that. Um, so this year, we'll, I'll, I will do just a, a gala concert with Lisette Oropesa, uh, the counter recital, and then for next year, hopefully everything will be back to normal. But it's a very, very special place to me. And Rosetta Kuki, who is the artistic director, is a director that I worked a lot with also in other places than at Wexford in Italy. And, um, and it's this very special thing because we, I discovered as an Italian, uh, we have so many things in common with Irish yeah. people. And <laughs> starting with the flag that is pretty much the same color, just the other way around. So. And in New York, Italian and Irish people marry all the time. There, there's many, many mixed marriages. It's a wonderful combination. I realized that there are actually two more things I want to talk to you about. One of them is what used to be called the Circuito Lombardo, the Lombardy circuit. A lot of people don't know that outside of the famous opera houses in Italy, the, the La Scala's and Florence and Venice and Torino and so forth, are and Naples, are regional opera companies and 
in Lombardy, where Milan is the capital, there are many wealthy towns with great cultures, such as Como and Bergamo and Brescia and Pavia, where I went to school, and Cremona, where Monteverdi was from, and Poncelli and violins and all that. So therefore, there exists this organization now called Aslico, which is basically an organization that produces four or five different opera productions every autumn, and they tour to those different cities. And the you've conducted numerous of these, so it's not La Scala, you live in Milan, and La Scala is its own world, but it is a fascinating insight into Italians and their relationship to opera. I don't wanna call it the provinces because that's dismissive, but in important cultural cities that were they not next to Milan would be very famous on their own. Talk about this phenomenon in Italy, but specific, they have an Emilia Romagna in the market, but talk about it for Lombardy. I think um, what is great is that in a way is a cooperation of smaller theater, but we're still talking about theater that sit about thousand people. Yeah. They were all built looking, most of them in the model of La Scala. So they look like Como looks like a, a small La Scala, but they're, you know, they, they were very important historically and they, they represent the regional theaters. Um, what is special about this that, as you said, they, they share four production, three, four production each year of the title, not necessarily, you know, Traviato Trovatore. I mean, I did La Voix Man with Anna Caterina Antonacci. I did Midsummer Night's nice Dream by Britain, mm -hmm. uh, but then I did Aida, I did Cavalleria Rustica. Um, what is really special is that when you go there as a performer, you feel sometimes more than the huge big theater that opera is really in the soil of the of this place you feel that you know people in brescia probably never heard before uh, midsummer nice dream by britain and but i think i had one of the most amazing success there like the audience was roaring after three hours of English opera from Shakespeare because and the Teatro Grande is such a beautiful theater and the people of Brescia dress up so magnificently to come there that that's also part of the experience is we forget the people used to in Italy really dress to go to the opera and they still do in Brescia yeah I think because it's just, it's not a show it's not really just to show off I mean like maybe that happens in the Scala premiere but I think it's a commitment to a heritage and you don't want to the heritage, the history of your place to find you, you know, not well dressed in a way. So it's, it, there is a, a kind of a, a certain ritual element to that. But I think it's a knowledge. And, and by this, it, this is very important to me. This is not exclusive. I mean, it doesn't mean that whoever doesn't belong to that is not included, but it's actually something to share. I mean, this, as you know, before the pandemic, you know, these places were full of, you know, American, British, German tourists, tourists from the East, Japanese tourists. It, it's just that it's something that you can experience in a way because it's in those smaller places where, you know, you have, where this theater has always been, have always been put on by, you know, wealthy middle-class Italian who wanted to have their own theater. Of course, as we all know, the history of Italy is such that it used to be divided in many, many small states. So each state had to have its own theater. So now that we are only one state, we find ourselves with you know, 50 theaters, one more beautiful than the other, which of course presents its own challenges as management goes on. But, and for example, the Aslico you mentioned is, you know, has been a very successful, you know, model uh, that, uh, you know, has been, has to thank many visionary women and men. Yes. Uh, in the, and I'm sure you know Barbara Minghetti. Who yes, was one and Como, sure. And, uh, but it's, it's really the work of a, of, of a group of people who feel passionate about the heritage. And most importantly, is one of the very few places in Italy where actually, Promise a bit like Wexford, promising star of tomorrow start. Yes, because uh, it's it, the Aslico has its own competition. They give roles for the competition for the operas in the competition, and that's how you know I did Tancredi by Rossini a few years ago, 
with uh, Mezzo was totally unknown, very young, uh, called Iervolino. And now she sings Cenerentola at the opera in Paris. Um, I recently heard her in Venice in, uh, Son in uh, Semiramide. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's very, that's wonderful. I, I could talk more about Aslico, but I want to take you back to one thing, my friend, in Torino. Um, Torino, I learned my Italian language living in Italy and speaking with people, but also, of course, reading. And the writer who really gave me my Italian as a reader was a Piedmontese writer named Cesare Pavese. Mm -hmm. And Pavese, who lived from 1908 to 1950, he committed suicide because he was brokenhearted over love and probably other reasons. Uh, an American actress broke his heart. He was the foremost interpreter, translator of American literature, not British literature, he did some, but American literature into Italian. His favorite book was Herman Melville's Moby Dick. He also translated Hemingway, the Spoon River Anthology. He nourished the careers of Primo Levi and Fernanda Pivano, who was the next great translator of Italian literature, who was married to the great designer Ettore Sozzas. I knew her well. And these people were incredible advocates in Italy for American language and literature. Pavese, I won't say imitated Hemingway or anyone else, he had his own style, but he had a directness and a lack of Baroque language and, and complicated language that some Italian writers had that made him very accessible to someone learning Italian. And he wrote beautiful poetry. He wrote a, a series of poems called Lavorare Stanca, which I'm mentioning specifically to you because I think there's a song cycle there in Lavorare Stanca. And if I were to pick the composer who has the gift because of your beautiful knowledge of English, your being Piedmontese, all of that, I'm just tossing it into your court and I want you to think about it. You don't have to give us an answer now, but I want our listeners to understand that the man that you've met just now, who I've had the honor to call a friend for more than a decade, is not only a summation of all, all that came before him, but as you can see, beautifully takes that, synthesizes it, brings it in other directions. And when people say there's no future in music, there's no future in opera, there's no future in symphonic, I just say, look at Francesco Cilufo. And I've had other people on the program, younger people like uh, Sasha Cook and Julia Bullock. And I want that Fred Plotkin on Fridays be a combination of having the grand old masters. I'm going to have one in two weeks. Um, with the wonderful talents that we have before us, because I want people to follow what you and Julia and Sasha and Michael Mays, who I have next week, are doing. And... You don't have to answer any of those questions, but I do want to see a song cycle of La Vorare Stanca. That's a great I, idea. I think so too. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to add to the listeners or to me or to the world? No, I think uh, I just I would just like to give um, uh, just a message at the end because we, I think we all been in different capacity struck by what's going on now in the world. Um, but I think as because we saw also how many nations uh, react to that and everything, I think especially mu we musician, we performer, we composer, I think this is the moment in, in, in which I think we are needed most. And I think it's the moment which we have to ourselves to imagine that history has proved uh, that in especially in the deeper crisis that we have to face, whether it's, you know, wars or pandemic or something, always is the seed for some great future, brighter future. I always say like Cantelli, a great Italian conductor, was rehearsing Così Fan Tutte, you know, with bomb falling on Milan. 
Yeah. Uh, and so many other stories we can say. So I think I think as a bit as the end, a bit as the end of, as in the end of Kaddish symphony. Uh, um, let's think that as Kaddish is not really about death, but about life. Let's think that in this moment, the illness is about feeling better, about being healthy. There's an important word laid in that symphony that I wonder if Lenny took it from Mahler's second symphony. In German, it's Glaube, in English, believe. Yes. And I know that Bernstein loved, I learned it from him, this Mahler second. Uh, and it, he focused always on that word, Glaube, believe. Yeah. I didn't think about it until just now, but that's how he concludes Scottish. Yeah. And thank you. Grazie, Francesco. Grazie. And thank you. It was a pleasure and an honor to be here. Go have your cold chicken now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I hope to see you soon. And listeners, next week, I have the wonderful American baritone, Michael Mays. You may not know him. You didn't know Sasha, perhaps. You didn't know Francesco, but these are our great people and, and you should look forward to hearing him next week. So Francesco, a presto e grazie. A presto. Ciao. Yeah.